I was recently recruited for the U.S. government, and today I'm preparing for my first case. We're investigating a company called Rion Global, as reports have been surfacing that they're performing unauthorized and illegal genetic enhancements on animals whose meat they mean to sell. From that introduction, you may assume I work for the FDA, maybe the CDC. Both assumptions are dead wrong, though. I work for the FBI. My name's Dexter Watson, and to be more specific, I work for the supernatural branch of the FBI. And yes, before you say it, I'm well aware that such a branch doesn't exist. We, as opposed to one of those other, more mundane organizations, were called in because these genetic enhancements may have crossed over what we call the Clarkson Threshold. I'm not sure why we call it that. I'm still pretty new here, but it describes the invisible line separating the things the public knows from the things we prevent the public from knowing. The FDA, the CDC, they're, well, they're below the Clarkson threshold. As I said, I'm still pretty new here, though. I was a junior in college last year when they recruited me. I was at Penn State on a football scholarship, the only way I could afford to attend college, and they had been putting me through a few tests that I didn't actually know were tests when they were happening, which was rather frightening, to say the least. Regardless, I passed them all, and I was informed of my passing by an unmarked envelope. Also included in that letter was an offer. Meet them at a disclosed location for a job offer. It was as simple as that. There was no figure given, no description either. The only information at all was provided at the bottom, and it was a modified version of the FBI logo. It was like the normal logo, all except the red and white striped insignia on the front, where normally it's just blank. On this version, there are two things in front of it. There was a sort of oblong, ovular shape running diagonally, and crossed with it was a large rectangle, with various sections of it jutting out to give it kind of a clunky look. No one's told me what either of them represent as of yet. If I'm being honest, I'm not really sure why I took the job. Maybe it was because I was tired of doing nothing with my life. Maybe it was the allure of a high-paying job with security. Or, hell, maybe it was because I wanted to help people. Whatever the reason, I met them at the location, and after hearing the details of the job, I accepted. Three weeks of vigorous training and briefing later, I'm here, two days away from my first mission. It's a routine one to be sure, as while genetic enhancement sounds exciting and dangerous, they hardly ever turn out to be, at least so I'm told. They say we usually catch on to them before they get out of hand, as genetic engineering leaves a pretty obvious energy signature, at least when one knows where to look. I've been partnered with Scarlett Gill on this one, an agent who joined right around the same time I did, and as a result, we were together through the majority of our training. We spent quite a bit of time together as a result, but very little time is allowed for personal talk during the three introductory weeks. We're working out, drilling, joking together, and we'd even come to like each other a little, but neither of us has been allowed to know a thing about the other's personal life until the training was complete. We're together now, Scarlett and I, as we pass the night before the job. She's certainly nice and enjoyable enough to be around, but more importantly, she's loyal. The FBI seems to enjoy making us believe we're in life-threatening scenarios when, in fact, it's merely another drill, something we enjoy significantly less, but every time they have, Scarlet's had my back. Penny for your thoughts, she asked, noticing my introspective attitude and raising an eyebrow at me. Afraid you wouldn't be getting your money's worth. I'm just, it's just a little weird. These past three weeks have been kind of a whirlwind, and the most boring thing we've done is find out about this assignment. I'm still holding out hope we're going to run into some kind of mutant chicken or something, she joked. Maybe even a man-eating cow. Are we really lowering our standards for excitement to man-eating cows? I mean, even I wasn't that pessimistic. Whatever, she said, rolling her eyes and leaning back in her chair. I'm just ready to get out of this place, to see some people again. Maybe the CEO will be some cute single guy who just needs the right girl to get him back on track. Maybe I'll meet the man of my dreams on this mission. Don't get your hopes up, I teased. I mean, it's Maine. You can't expect Ben Affleck. Oh, she asked, and I assume that Jennifer Lopez is just waiting for you, right? Something like that, I said, nodding and laughing. We both joke, sharing some pre-mission banter, but in reality, there would be no matchmaking during this mission, and we both knew it. We would be arriving unannounced, and there was no telling how anyone at the company would react. Sure, it was just your average check-in to keep them honest, but what if they panicked? It wouldn't be the least unlikely thing that would happen. As the laughter trailed off into silence, Scarlet finally said, You know, we should probably get some sleep. It's a long drive to Maine. Sure is, I agreed. Both of us being rookies on a routine mission, we hadn't been deemed important enough to garner a full flight. So, we were stuck driving one of the old clunky SUVs the Bureau kept, 
to the best of my knowledge, for the sole purpose of hazing. So, yawning a bit, I bid her good night, and we retreated to our respective bunks for the evening. March 20th. I'm not usually prone to nightmares, but I had one last night. I was in a forest, I think, and a faceless man stood in front of me. Behind him and to his left was a wild horse, bucking and neighing loudly. It was surrounded by thorns, and every time it reared back on its hind legs, it came down impaling itself on them. To the right was Scarlet, bound at her hands and feet. I didn't know what was going on. I tried to ask him, but I found that I was frozen in place, unable to move or do anything as the faceless man looked down at me tauntingly. I woke up in a cold sweat an hour before my alarm set off, so I quietly showered, got dressed, and walked outside, allowing the brisk morning air to fill my lungs. It was always calming being out this early. It put it all in perspective. The assignment was just an assignment. My dream had just been a dream. The base we were at was tucked away in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, by far the most beautiful place I'd ever seen in my life. As the sun rose in the east, I leaned on a railing overlooking an immense horizon. Mountains dropped off beneath me, only to pick up in the forest that spread out below me. After what must have been miles of forest, the first rays that would eventually become the blazing ball of light that was the sun peeked out at me. I took a deep breath, then exhaled. I always wondered why they wasted such a great view on a military base. A voice from behind me surprised me, causing me to jump. I turned around and found Carmen Clay, my direct supervisor, who coincidentally had been promoted to her post at around the same time Scarlet and I arrived. She walked over to the railing and leaned on it as well, looking out across the horizon. So much natural beauty. Contrast is the stark coldness of the Bureau. It's two different worlds. I cleared my throat and agreed with her. She looked at me for a moment. You have something that not a lot of people do, you know. You know how to talk yourself off a ledge, and that'll get you a long way in this department. Thank you, ma'am. She gazed down at the forest for another moment before continuing. A wise man once told me that for every one thing that goes right on a mission, ten things are bound to go wrong by the time you're finished celebrating. Remember that. I let her words sink in as she returned to the main compound. At first, it just seemed like she was getting in on the fun of piling on the new guy, but that didn't at all fit with what I knew about her. There was more to what she was saying than just to poke fun at me. Scarlet was awake a half hour later, and a briefing followed not long after. The briefing was relatively short. We already knew most of the details. It was just some general information that hadn't been covered yet. Then we were off, just like that. There was no send-off, no hearty goodbyes. The briefing ended, and we were on our way. It was a three-hour drive to the re headquarters in Old Town, Maine, and I drove the first half, with Scarlet picking up the back end. The conversation remained light while it was alive, which wasn't the majority of the ride. But still, there was general optimism, and I could feel it as we drove. First, we passed the sign informing us we'd entered Maine, a milestone achievement very early on in the journey. Then we passed through Bethel, then Skokagan, then Bangor, and finally, we saw the signs for Old Town. Our massive, bulky SUV stood out in the small town, even as we neared the center of industry that was Rion headquarters. All the vehicles up here were small, either tiny sedans or, for the more wealthy people, little convertibles or sports cars. We towered over almost everything, and word spread fast in a town like this. People wondered why we were here, and they weren't shy about asking. We drew some stairs, and the closer we got to our destination, the more people I saw take out their phones and dial a number when they saw us. When the third person did so, I pointed it out to Scarlet. Someone's getting advance notice that we're on our way, I told her, gesturing back to the man on the phone. They're a tight-knit community here, so much for the element of surprise. Not a great sign, she said with a nod. If they've got people out to let them know when someone is coming, they've probably got something to hide. With that, we came into view of the massive sprawling complex. Rion headquarters was a sight to behold. The main entrance dominated by a huge statue of the company's logo in the middle of a U-shaped driveway. The front of the building was a large glass room, but at the height the sun was in the sky, we couldn't see into it yet. The glass rose up to more than two stories high, then dip back down before turning into cement and rising up into the offices in the first level. It was only six stories high, but its size came in its width. We had just reached the far edge of the building, and we still had nearly a quarter mile to go to reach the entrance. The headquarters seemed big enough to be its own city. Why would anyone need this much space, Scarlet murmured, echoing my thoughts. As she approached the driveway, she asked, Do we just park here? I don't see a lot or anything. We've got government plates, it's not like they're going to tow us, but that's definitely weird, I concurred. 
She pulled into the driveway behind the fountain, parking the car in front of the front doors. There was a surprising lack of activity as we approached the glass doors. Ours was the only car in the long driveway, and as we approached, we seemed to be the only people making our way into the building. As we entered, we saw that it was empty, save for the receptionist at the desk. I glanced curiously at Scarlet, as no greeting came from her, and we slowly let the doors close behind us. Hello, ma'am, Scarlet said, her voice echoing around the silent lobby. We're here with the FBI. We'd like to take a look around. There was no response. It was a large lobby, and it took us some time to get closer after several more unsuccessful attempts at communication. Our footsteps on the tiles filled the otherwise empty room as we made our way towards the desk. And then, as details became clearer, it was obvious that something was off. The receptionist had a blank look on her face. She wasn't asleep, yet still she didn't reply. We hadn't noticed until we got far enough away from the front windows, but the lights were out. We both felt the oddness of the situation, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw Scarlet's hand drift to the butt of her pistol, preparing to draw it at any moment. I did the same. When we arrived at the desk, she still hadn't reacted to us. Something was definitely off. Wordlessly, I moved my hand in front of her eyes for a moment. Nothing. Then I held the backs of my hand up to her nose. I glanced up at Scarlet. Nothing. She's dead. Dead? What the hell? Why is she still at the desk? Maybe she had a condition, I offered. Call it in. I'll check for a medical bracelet or something. Scarlet nodded and retreated back a few steps to report to our supervisors. I made my way around the desk. There was nothing to show she had some sort of medical condition, but it wasn't long before I found the cause of her death. When I tilted her body forward, a bullet wound slowly oozed blood. It was a small hole, most likely a pistol caliber, and when I opened her shirt, I found the exit wound. Someone had cleaned it up, though. What the hell? I mumbled. I looked back at Scarlet, but she was still fiddling with her radio. When she saw me looking, she said, Damn thing won't work. I'm just getting static. What's the deal with her? She's dead, I replied. It looks like someone knew what they were doing. They cleaned up the front of it, so... Then it clicked. We both came to it practically simultaneously. I vaulted over the desk, making for the door access to the long lobby, and as I did so, the metal safety grate began to slide down. Its gears ground loudly as it slowly began the process of cutting off our path to freedom. Scarlet had a head start, having already been on the other side of the desk, and she reached the door when the grate was still almost a foot off the ground. She pounded on the glass with her fist, but after that was unsuccessful, she slipped her gun out of her holster and fired it into the glass once, twice, three times. However, the bullets didn't penetrate. The glass was bulletproof. Damn it, she mumbled, slamming the butt of her gun onto the glass. I caught up with her at that point and looked through the thin slit that had allowed the lights in through the grate. What the hell's going on, I breathed, shaking my head. We're stuck in here, Scarlet said, and she looked around the lobby. For a moment, her words echoed faintly down the dark room, and we let it sink in, taking stock of our situation. Something was going on, something that someone was willing to kill to keep under wraps. Whoever it was was very wealthy and very intelligent. They had not only known to jam the radio frequencies, but had the means of doing it, and they were either in possession of power at the company or commanded enough respect to lead enough people to establish this lockdown. I had narrowed it down to either the CEO or a head scientist, with the CEO being the more likely of the two, but this was all in the first minute of having this knowledge. So what now, Scarlet asked, sliding her gun back into her holster. There's only one thing we can do. Find out what they're trying to hide. Are you crazy? This was supposed to be a routine checkup. We're not equipped to get in a gunfight. For all we know, a terrorist cell could have taken this place hostage and they're armed to the teeth. I nodded. Outside assailants were a situation I hadn't thought of. Well, what else would we do, I asked. If we want to escape this place, our only way is into the looking glass. I don't like that metaphor, Scarlet noted. But yeah, I suppose you're right. And if we're going into the deadly genetic engineering lab, we might as well do our job, I finished. She nodded. So much for Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez, she muttered as we began to walk to the hallway that would take us to the rest of the building. The lobby was set up so that the receptionist would be able to have seen anybody attempting to enter the complex. There was no furniture, not even a potted plant, just cold white tile and then the desk. Behind the desk were two doors, one on the left and one on the right, and we learned in the briefing that each led in a different direction. To the left was the business end of the headquarters. Decisions, accounts, and computing occurrences. To the right was the science portion, 
laboratories, testing chambers. That took up the majority of the real estate there, and that was where we were heading. If an answer lay anywhere in this darkened house of death, we believed it would be there. So I took point, and we entered the looking glass. The lights were still out in the hallway, and it was nearly impossible to see. Scarlet pulled out her flashlight, the thin beam piercing through the darkness and lighting up a tiny area of the hall. It wasn't much, but it was better than pitch black. The suffocating darkness surrendered a little to help us piece together the mystery. For the most part, it was just a white sterile hallway without any form of decoration. Ever so often, we'd see something that looked a little off. A dark smear on a wall, a fluorescent light casting that had been torn out of its original shell and smashed on the ground, but for the most part during the first hallway there was nothing. However, when we reached the end of it and arrived at a door, things began to ramp up. The door was the same material as the rest of the hallway, and had it not been cracked slightly open, it would have been highly likely that we wouldn't have even noticed it. Upon closer inspection, I saw that there was a thumbprint scanner on the right of it, and it must have utilized electronic locks, which would have gone out whenever the power did. Do we go in? Scarlet asked. I mean, we're already gone this far, I replied. What's the worst that can happen? Don't say that. You know that never ends well, she said. I rolled my eyes and pulled the door open further, allowing us to look in through the entryway. The room appeared to be a testing chamber for genetic engineering. About ten feet in there, there was a glass wall with a heavily secured door in the center, leading to an airlock, and then to an area where the tests were performed. There was a table with straps on it, several cages in the corner, and then a chair with straps on it too. All were splattered in dark red. I groaned slightly at the sight, and then the smell hit me through the airlock. It hit me like a ton of bricks, and I kneeled over as I tried not to retch. The smell was putrid, and I thought there was no way I was going to make it any further. I was about to say something when Scarlet beat me to it. What's wrong, she said, pointing her pistol around the room to check for danger. Are you okay? You don't, you don't smell that, I said, tears in my eyes as I mercifully became adjusted to the smell. God, it's rancid. Smell what? It's just blood. There's something else. There must be a body in here or something. It's starting to fade, but you're telling me you can't smell that at all? No, she muttered. That's strange. Come on, let's see if we can find anything in here. I followed after her, figuring maybe the smell had dissipated by the time she got into the room, and not really seeing anything weird about it. The blood was dried, it looked like it had been there for days, and it covered virtually every surface. As I circled around, trying to find any semblance of a clue to what had happened, I spotted a camera in the top right corner. I was about to point it out to Scarlet, when suddenly, a noise from behind us caused us both to freeze. It was a scratching noise, like a small animal burrowing around. That was in the corner that we hadn't searched yet, of course, and it was obscured by the initial view by a small wall that cut off the glass viewing room, so we had no idea it was there. The scrabbling continued, noticeably muffled, and then there was an odd squish. The noise paused for a moment, and I slowly turned my head to lock eyes with Scarlet. The unspoken agreement was to turn and pump whatever was back there full of lead, and we held our breath for half a second. Then we whipped around the corner, firing round after round into it, the burst of light obscuring the dark corner from our view. After a few moments, I stopped, and she followed. I shined my flashlight into the corner and saw the bloodied, shredded, unrecognizable lump. Whatever had happened to it, it was long dead before we had gotten there. What the hell made that noise, she whispered. I didn't respond. We stood there in silence for a moment, neither of us wanting to be the one to volunteer to investigate the pulp. Fine, I guess I'll do it, I finally relented, reluctantly returning my gun to my holster but you owe me one. She rolled her eyes and I cautiously approached the lump that glistened sickeningly in the light of Scarlet's flashlight. Upon closer inspection, I could almost make out that it had been a human torso. However, it was destroyed. All the skin, at least the skin that would have been facing up, had been torn away, explaining the bloodied appearance. There was only one arm left, the left one, and it was tucked under the body until I pulled it out again. It was clenching something in its hand, a slip of paper it appeared, and I attempted to pry it loose. Hurry up, Scarlet urged. I think I heard something out in the hall. That's just your imagination, I replied, tugging on the paper. It was wedged tightly, and the person must have had an iron grip. Then, just as the paper slid free, something burst out of its back. I stumbled backwards, crying out as the thing leapt at me. What is it? Scarlet exclaimed, her attention having been focused on the entrance to the hallway. As I recovered from my initial shock, I realized the tiny ball of fur was just that. Tiny. It looked like a rat, a decently sized one for sure, but there was something wrong with it. I didn't have much experience with rats, but the way it walked, 
the dull look in its dead little eyes. Something was off. You big baby, Scarlet teased, helping me up after she picked the rat off of me and tossed it into the corner. <laughs> what, you scared of a little rat? Something's wrong here, I said. I don't like it. Scarlet glanced around at the carnage. Really? You have a team of monkeys working around the clock on that one? The rat, it, it wasn't normal, I said, ignoring her sarcasm. This place, why is it covered in blood? That was a human body. What happened to it? Then I heard what Scarlet must have heard earlier. There was a sound of someone, or something, pounding on metal. Three dull thuds, then a hollow groan permeated down the hallway. Is that... Yeah, she returned in an equally low tone. Whatever it is, it's between us and the exit. Wordlessly, I drew my gun again, nodding at the door, and we cautiously crept back towards the hallway, out of the testing chamber. As we left, the rat scurried off behind us, startling us a little. With that, we set off. The unspoken agreement seemed to be that if whatever had made that sound earlier did it again, we would be going to investigate. Chances are, we would be spending an undesirable amount of time with it anyway. I figured, why not get acquainted with it? Obviously, I wasn't keen on meeting the thing, and I only wanted to do it if the opportunity arose. I was kind of hoping internally that we wouldn't run across it. However, as it often does, my hopes were unfounded. Before we'd even reached the halfway point, a terrified shriek came from the door we had just passed. Then, before we could react, something slammed into the glass porthole at the top of the door. I jumped back, training my pistol on that eight-inch circle of glass as whatever it was dragged across the clear surface, smearing what looked like blood across it. I held a finger to my lips as Scarlet glanced at me, and she nodded. There was no movement for a moment, so I slowly approached the door and reached for the knob. Whatever was behind the door let out a mighty roar and then slammed its head into the window. I must have jumped a mile at the noise, and I quickly regained my wits, aiming my gun back at the small viewing port into the room. What I saw was disturbing, to say the least. Though it was pressed up against the glass and slightly distorted by it, I could tell it was human, or at least it had been at one point. It had stringy black hair that was matted down with blood, blood that streaked across the glass as the creature pressed harder and harder against it, trying to break through. Its skin was a human shade, but it was stretched and waxy, looking as if it had been torn like paper. Then, there was its eyes. The emotion, or lack thereof, I'd seen in the beady eyes of that rat was amplified a hundredfold in the eyes of this creature. There was nothing. Two empty pits, devoid of color and life, entirely black. There was no iris, no white. It was just pitch. As it continued pounding on the door, much to our horror, several more groans and thuds began emanating from all around the hallway. There were more of those creatures all throughout the hallway, and worse, not all the doors were locked. Come on, I shouted over the den. We gotta go. We began running down towards the lobby. Hands groped out at us through the darkness, one of them even flailing as it attempted to body check me, but no serious threat was proposed at us until we were ten feet from the exit. One of the doors flung open at that moment, and I ran directly into it. I was momentarily stunned as it knocked me off my feet. My gun fell out of my hand, skittering off into the darkness. I heard Scarlet utter a curse as she was about to start shooting at the thing, when suddenly, one of them grabbed me from behind. I shouted for help, still disoriented, trying to attack the creature that was grabbing me. She whipped her head around, and in a moment of distraction, one of them had opened the door and took hold of her. She slammed her elbow into its guts and prepared to duck under the grasp provided by its reaction, but it had none. Instead, it reared its head back and sunk its teeth into her upper arm, tearing at it aggressively. She cried out in pain. Meanwhile, I was just hardly avoiding a similar fate. I'd managed to get a position of leverage on the head of the creature, but it was strong and untiring. I could feel my strength giving way when suddenly I heard the door burst open ahead of me. Initially, I thought it was more of the creatures emerging to snuff out the last remaining bits of fire in us. I thought that was the end, and I closed my eyes, lessening my hold on the creature's head. Then, instead of jaws and death, I heard a dull clunk and felt the weight lifted off me. I opened my eyes to see that the creature had been sent stumbling backwards, a series of dents in the center of its face. Get up, get up, a voice shouted, a figure appearing in my vision, extending a hand to help me. Come on, we gotta go. I accepted his help, and the first thing I noticed when I got to my feet was he was wearing a surgical mask. Then, I noticed that he was carrying a crowbar. Seeing my confused look, he said, I'll explain later, we gotta get out of here. 
Wait, I protested. Scarlet was still struggling feebly against the creature that had bit her in the arm, and I rushed over to her, grabbing onto the creature's head and prying apart its teeth. Go, go, I hissed to Scarlet. Free from the thing's maw, she made for the exit immediately, and I followed not too long after, once I had stunned the creature sufficiently that it wouldn't follow us directly. However, during that time, the way to the exit slowly began to close as more of the creatures pressed in. With a sudden burst of adrenaline, I sprinted forward, bowling over two of them, and when one lunged out at me, I grabbed his wrist in a hold I knew so well I had practiced automatically and snapped the flimsy bones. Then I dove for the exit, tucking my body into a roll as I passed through the opening. When I did so, our masked savior slammed the door shut behind me, sliding in several deadbolts I hadn't noticed before. They seemed hastily installed, and I guess they hadn't been there until, well, until those creatures were. Breathing heavily, I slowly made my way back to my feet. Scarlet was sitting against the reception desk, clutching her arm as it oozed steadily. The man in the mask finished locking up, and then turned back to face me. What the hell is going on here, I panted. I suppose you're with the FBI, he remarked. I'll explain everything, don't worry. Well, perhaps you should be worried, but for different reasons. Yeah, I said, sucking in air. Clearly. You're going to want to come with me. I could explain everything here, but trust me, it'll be much easier if we can get everyone together. The walk to the rooms they'd established as their base was a strange one. The building seemed so normal. It just looked like an after-hours office building. I judged by this time that night had come on in the first day. Most of the rooms looked undisturbed, as if someone could step right in and get right to work. However, the deeper we got into the business section of the building, the less and less likely that became. At first, it was just the little things. A desk would be upturned, blocking the door, or a potted plant had been knocked over, spilling the dirt across the carpet. But then it took on a darker turn. Occasionally, dark blood would be smeared in gory streaks across the wall, or a corpse would lie unattended on the ground. Windows were shattered, the carpet was torn up, the wall fixtures lay in shambles on the floor. Little things, little aesthetic touches. Then we entered the final hallway. At the end of the hallway, there was a sealed door that led to an elevator. From the blueprints I'd studied, I knew it led to the higher corporate offices. But we didn't go that way. Instead, we entered the conference room in the middle of the hallway. When he opened the door, he looked back at us, seemingly in thought for a moment. You'd had better wait out here. Just a precaution. Don't worry. They've never made it this far. I'll come and get you in just a minute. Glad to see you're rolling out the welcome wagon, I said, but he'd already entered the room. I helped Scarlet sit down and slid to the floor myself, not before taking a peek into the conference room, though. It was a dismal sight to behold. There were about 20 people in there, all in various stages of grief or despair. Some huddled in groups, others sat alone. Still others sat at the table, tending to the four wounded people who lay bleeding in the large conference table. Some of the people wore surgical masks, though most didn't. The man who'd saved us was in deep conversation with three of the four others, standing close to the entrance, away from the others. I glanced over at Scarlet and saw through the darkness that she was crying. I thought better of making small talk, and we waited in silence for about a half a minute. Then, she was the one to break it. We're in over our heads. We have to find a way to contact someone. They have to come and find us. I'll talk to this guy, but we can't get hysterical. We need to keep our wits about us. We knew this was a possibility. Well, not this, but something of this magnitude. We're prepared. We can handle this. What makes you think we can handle this? What have you ever gone through in life that makes you assume you can handle this? At that moment, though, the door swung open, and the man who'd let us in emerged. I was grateful for the distraction, since I truly had no answers. All right, he said. I owe you an explanation. My name is Jace Morrison. I'm, well, I was the director of product management with Ryon. Since there's quite a bit to cover, I'll open it to you from the very beginning. What do you want to know? I looked over at Scarlet, but she had already begun to ask, What the hell were those things? Did they have to do with the genetic engineering that was going on here? Yes. Yes, they do, he sighed. They were the product of what we're calling IM-01 disease. Those things, they used to be human. And to your second question, yes, it does have to do with genetic engineering. We're still not entirely sure how, but it's believed that one of the test subjects had an undiscovered dormant genetic trait that was set off by the experiments. That trait reacted negatively to testing, producing IM-01. I'm sure it could be explained better, but the people you just met are in the best position to explain it to you. So you were experimenting on humans, Scarlet asked. This is worse than I thought. What is IM-01? How does it spread? 
What are the effects, I asked, signifying that he didn't have to answer that rhetorical question. IM-01 is an airborne disease. However, it dies very quickly unless it finds a host. If it does so, it slowly begins to take over the host's body until it has gained complete control, at which point it rewrites the brain to amplify aggression, delete pain receptors, and reduce logical thought. The process generally takes about 12 hours. At least, that's what we've seen. And visible signs that the host is infected will not begin to show until approximately the 10-hour mark. Can it be transferred once the host is converted, I asked, nervous that it could have been transferred during the scuffle with the creatures. There's only been one instance of it, and it was after the creature had reached full maturity, which takes about 24 hours after the transformation is complete. At that point, the disease becomes fortified, being able to survive indefinitely outside the host, and is present in the creature's very breath. I looked at Scarlet and saw that she'd reached the same conclusion I had. You knew about this then, she asked accusingly. You know too much about it. You knew about the consequences, but, if I may guess, you chose to test the creatures and the disease instead of reporting it. Then an outbreak happened, and now you're here. Yes, but I assure you, the decision was entirely Mr. Rowan's himself. I'm sure you're also curious about the radio blackout, security gates, and the unfortunate death of Miss Naomi West. That was all a result of the paranoid CEO, Andrew Rian. He was the one that ordered the genetic research in the first place. And when he did so, he installed several measures that would ensure the headquarters could become entirely self-sustained in the event that such an event did occur. He had since separated himself from us. He locked himself in the corporate suites, where he just so happens to have full control over all the security measures, at least the ones he can power with the backup generator. However, before he or those loyal to him retreated, he knew that he was going to have to deal with the inspectors, such as yourself. So, he shot Naomi. He cleaned up the wound and propped her up in the chair so that you would approach, giving him sufficient time to activate the security gate and the frequency jammer. He's entirely delusional. His goal is to wait out the death of every single living thing in the building, and then to continue with operations as normal. There is nothing we can do. We cannot put our lives above that of the entirety of humanities. As if, if we were to make an escape attempt, the risk would be too great that the IMM-01 would follow us, and I'm sure I don't need to explain the consequences of that. We've managed to secure all the creatures we know of in the experimental hallway. There are certainly a few that continue to roam unabated. Now we currently don't have a method of determining if a subject is or isn't infected, so if you two would spend the night in another office, perhaps? Oh sure, of course, I said. I mean, is there anything you can do about her arm? I think the bleeding stopped, but an infection would probably be deadly. He held his breath helplessly. We have no medical supplies. If you've already stopped the bleeding, that's about as much as can be done. Scarlet nodded grimly, and without another word, he left, returning to the conference room. She looked over to me as the doors closed. You still think we're ready for this? It's worse than we thought, I said, repeating her sentiment from earlier. You know how we're going to get out of here, though, right? She asked. I grinned weakly, looking down the hall at the sealed metal door. I sure do. Despite her pessimism, she had retained that calculating mind that helped her so much during training and we remained on the same page. Come on, help me up, she said. I'm not sleeping out here. Let's find a nice office or something. The information having lifted our spirits, if only slightly, I lifted her up and walked her around for a few minutes before finding a suitable office. Then, as I helped her to lie down on a rather plush couch, she paused, looking curiously into my eyes. What? Then the curiosity turned to fear. Give me your flashlight, she ordered. What's wrong, I asked. I, just give it to me, she exclaimed and I hastily retrieved it, handing it over to her. She clicked it on, then shone it into my eyes. Gah! I exclaimed, shielding my eyes as the sudden burst of light blinded me. What's that for? Put that thing away. Show me your eyes, she demanded, and I opened them, squinting into the harsh light. Dexter, your eyes, she trailed off. What's wrong with my eyes? What's going on? They're black, she replied. What do you... I began, and then the realization hit me. Scarlet slowly propped herself up on her good arm and inched back away from me. Stay back, she said, a look of fear in her eyes. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's story. Before this video gets quite long enough, let's go ahead and thank our patrons. Thanks to Janet for being our Spooky Skeleton Chair contributor, and thanks to Zeronin and Emily Coltsfoot and Leslie Lou Riddle for being our Ghostly Reader Tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you, too, would like to support the show, come on down to Patreon. We have many great tier rewards, including getting your stories early and having your name read out at the end of every TikTok and every YouTube video that I do. 
Tonight's tale is brought to you by Suspicious Nail 949 from Reddit. If you enjoy his work, I've left a link to this story. You can see what else you like that he's got, and you can follow him there on Reddit. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.